field tester, our hunting gear show, where we test outdoor kit so you can make better buying decisions. In this episode. Eco, bio or organic, we test the most environmentally friendly shotgun shells available in the UK market. Plus, lethal lentils, we test our own vegan shell, so woke it can only be shot from the left hand barrel. That one will go. Are you going to shoot it? Yes. Can we? You can shoot that one. Yeah. Honestly. Nah. Okay. You can shoot that one. Staying with the meat free theme, we ask animal health specialist Dr. David Marlin if vegan dog food takes the biscuit. Also, we have our gun shop gurus delivering independent advice and suggestions on kits ranging from the best springer on the market to why you need to clean your moderator. Welcome, Welcome to, to Field, Field Tester. On test this week, the Teslas of the shotgun cartridge world. So what are the products and the innovations? Well, if you're shooting steel, the cartridge wad needs to cradle or cup the more abrasive shot as it travels down the barrel. Bio ammo, Game Boar's new bio wad, Ely's eco wad and Joker's paper wad all do this. The Game Boar and Ely wad technology means they dissolve in water in about 24 hours. Paper is paper, and the bio ammo wad will compost over a season. If you're shooting lead, then fibre is already a firm eco-friendly option, but there can be a plastic film. Empire is now offering a biodegradable hemi seal using an enviro wad and a biodegradable gas seal, which will start composting within six weeks. BioAmmo is the only company producing an eco case. However, compared to a wad, these are easy to collect, dispose of and recycle. But plastic is plastic. Eco shells, for want of a, a better term, we've got lots of different varieties here uh, and we're doing lots of different testing with it during this show. But Jason, have you actually shot any of these? I haven't. I mean, I'm familiar with some of them, some of the older ones. But for me, the interesting thing about this is not the lead versus steel debate. For me personally, it's a plastic thing. And what I love about these cartridges and what I was really keen to try is the fact that they're all using non-plastic wads. And we've had fibre wads on the scene for a long time, but there's certain issues with fibre using in steel cartridges and issues with fibre sealing, issues with performance. What all these cartridges do is cure that by using biodegradable wads, which work the same as a plastic wad. So for me, it was about going out and testing them and making sure that everything we had as a replacement for plastic and as a potential replacement for lead was going to work perfectly. Okay. In, a, in our previous show, Tim, we were dealing with alternatives to lead when it came to the, the bullets. Uh, it's quite exciting, really, that the, the industry as a whole, you know, whether it's bullets or whether it's shotgun shells, are moving in a very similar direction. We, we haven't really sort of seen technological advances of, of this nature, I would imagine. I think it's really exciting because we've done the, 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 the lead v, v copper and we, in some ways, we're the, we're the start of that process. And to be able to test 14 different types of bullets and now to test a variety of, uh, of these alternatives, I think it's really exciting because I think we are starting that journey. We need to educate people, we need to show people the weaknesses and maybe the strengths. So it's, it's really good. Okay, so there's quite a bit of cultural change involved with this, but to see whether they're actually effective, we did our first test using gel blocks. Okay, Mr. Doyle, this is uh, our gel test. So just explain what we're gonna kick off with. Yeah, our phase one of our gel test, we have some ballistic gel and we're gonna test the penetration capabilities of some of these cartridges we have. We're gonna use a 32 gram Dark Storm lead. It's a 32 gram five, and that's going to be our control. And from that, we're going to judge how good some of these steel cartridges are. And we're going to compare like with like, so to speak. So we're going to use a standard steel cartridge in 32 gram five, just to see if it comes anywhere near the penetration of the lead. It shouldn't do really, because the sort of rule of thumb is you go up two shot sizes in steel to get anything like the performance you would in lead. So to try and prove that then we're going to go to our 32 gram 3 high performance load game board dark storm in steel and just compare the three see does the steel come anywhere near the lead and just test the penetrations and what we'd be comfortable in using we're going to do it at 35 yards which having pasted out looks like a long way but 
people say Not it's... Not for a man like you. Well, I've just realised I probably don't shoot as many pheasants at 50 yards as I thought I did before because 35 <laughs> yards is a long way. And um, we'll see very quickly how good I am if I can hit that gel block. 32 gram, 5 lead. So what have we got, Jason? It's come probably between two thirds and three quarters of the way through, which is quite nice. What we didn't want to see was the lead come right the way through. I'm quite surprised every one of those pellets has pretty much deformed. I don't know if that will be on impact with the gel or just the way they've, they've hit off each other in the pattern. It's really interesting to see. So that's your standard fibre wad that they've always used. And then this is the new quad seal, which is the biodegradable sealing disc. Because the issue with fibre wads has always been that some of the charge gets around the fibre wad because it doesn't expand in the chamber as a plastic wad would. But with this, they've solved that problem and that's completely biodegradable, that little. You can see the integrity of that compared to the fibre, can't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm amazed how well that's held together coming out of the gun at, at that speed. But 24 hours in water and, and that's gone. So we'll try now with the steel Try a 32 gram five in the steel and shoot it at the same end and see how much penetration we get. See, would it be judged enough to kill a bird at that range? Okay, so now we're gonna try the standard steel Ely VIP Pro Eco Wad in a 32 gram five. That's our wad. That's your Ely Pro Eco Wad. Well, it's got these sort of little connections between the wings and they haven't broken, so it's held together well. For me, if we'd found it and it was like this, it might show that the shot wasn't being well cupped by the wad, but that seems to have held together pretty well. Ooh. For the steel, there. Yeah. Furthest lead is there. Okay. So. Be happy with that? Are you pleased with that? I am. I mean, if if this gel, for argument's sake, was the same consistency as a pheasant or a partridge, that is, that, that steel shot has penetrated a good three and a half, four inches. So it's a dead bird at 35 yards. An easily dead bird. So that's a standard velocity steel at 35 yards, pheasant, partridge, pigeon, duck. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be dead. Now, <laughs> that's just on penetration. The way the shot delivers energy and stuff like that, the actual stopping power of it might be slightly different and we can't judge that by shooting ballistic gel, but just by comparing ballistics, I'm reasonably pleased with how far that has penetrated the gel. And I'd have no problem using them on game at that range. Definitely no problem. Okay, so how are we going to mix it up now? What are we going to do next? Now we're going to use a high performance steel load in a tree. And traditionally people say that for steel to perform as effectively as lead, you need to up the shot size a couple of sizes. So we're going to go to a high performance game bore steel load in a tree with the quad seal system. And I would expect it to penetrate as far as the number five lead shot. So we'll try that and see what happens. Our last one on this test is a game board Dark Storm high performance steel in a 32 gram three. Okay, so that's really interesting. Those number three steel shot have penetrated to the same depth as the shallowest of the lead but not as far as the deepest of the lead. But the consistency of that penetration is really, really good. We've had four pellets hit and they're within an eighth of an inch of being as deep as each other. And that's so actually- They would have been less, less shot in there anyway, wouldn't they? A lot less shot because a bigger pellet, but it's, it's interesting to see even from the 
standard performance steel, very, very consistent penetration depth compared to lead. And what's interesting as well is the steel shot has retained its roundness <laughs> way better than the lead. And I think that will have contributed to the consistent penetration. I am surprised by how distorted the shape of the lead shot has become. It hasn't happened with steel shot. Obviously steel shot is a lot harder, so it's gonna hold its shape better. But I didn't expect to see that. But isn't that the point? It's supposed to be imparting its energy and therefore just like with a, a lead bullet, it's supposed to be creating a greater cavity? Yes, but I would have thought that if, if that happened to the lead shot on impact, the flat surface would be at the front of the pellet. And with these, it's not, it's sort of all over them. Now, maybe they've tumbled as they've gone into the, into the block, but yeah, it's, it is interesting nonetheless. Really what our first test has done is proved that by stepping the shot size up to a three from a five, steel will penetrate just as far as lead, a high performance steel that is. But what it's also shown, which I'm pleasantly surprised about is that the standard steel cartridge in a 32 gram 5 penetrated remarkably well at 35 yards and those are the cartridges that people are going to be able to use in their guns that don't have a fleur de -lis proof mark so that's going to be your older guns as long as they're capable of taking steel they can take those standard performance steel cartridges and at 35 yards I think we've proved that they're going to be very effective. We've also shown that both the game bore and Ely Eco wads are holding together extremely well. Both of these wads will dissolve in 24 hours in water. So your gun is going to be well protected from the steel shot. And you can comfortably shoot these on farmland, on grouse moors, on pheasant shoots, and be sure that they're going to dissolve super quickly. You're not leaving any plastic around the countryside. So this wasn't to put Ely against game board by any means. We've got lots of other cartridges here from Empire, from Joker, from BioAmmo and we're going to try them now on new ballistic gel blocks and just see if they penetrate as well as these ones and whether we would be comfortable using them in a hunting situation. Okay, so here's another couple of green cartridges um, from BioAmmo. And BioAmmo, basically, all the traditionally plastic components of the cartridge are biodegradable or compostable, including the case, including the wad, and the base wad, everything like that. So we've got two offerings from them. We have a 32 gram 6 in lead and a 32 gram 5 in steel. I was really interested to try these, even though we all pick up our cartridges and some cartridges are widely recyclable, it's just quite a faff to do that. At least these, there's just zero plastic being used in them. So we're all trying to reduce the amount of plastic we use. And if these are as effective as more mainstream brands, then I would have absolutely no problem using them and I would really be encouraged to use them just because of the fact that they have zero plastic used in them. Okay, so Bio Ammo Lux 32 gram 6 in lead. Ooh. Kicks a bit that one. <laughs> Speak to me Doyle. Okay, so they've penetrated pretty well. You can see you can just see by the, the tracks into the gel that some of them have been sort of tumbling and distorted as they went in. So that's obviously going to deliver more energy into the gel, which will, if it was a bird, would kill it better. But yeah, they've penetrated really well for a, for a, a six shot. So now we have the bio ammo high performance steel in a 32 gram five. That's penetrated really well, almost as far as the lead, and it's up to a couple of the lead pellets. Okay, so here's our three biodegradable steel shot wads. They've done what they're supposed to do. They've held together, they've delivered the shot to the target, and it looks like all of them have protected the barrels from the shot. The Game Bore and Ely one 
have held together a little bit better than the bio ammo. But that's not to say the bio ammo didn't do its job perfectly well. It's just these two seem to have retained their shape a little bit better. But really interesting to try it. For me, it would feel quite strange to walk away and leave these on the field because they look like plastic wad. But that's just getting it into our head that these are totally biodegradable, totally compostable, and in a couple of days in the right conditions, there'll be zero trace of them. And that, I have to applaud the manufacturers for taking the step to do that because it's a significant step in what we as shooters can do for the environment. Quite badly hurt. Okay, JD. So these are a 32 gram six from Empire Cartridges and Empire are a UK company who make their cartridges in Lancashire. And this is their version of an environmentally friendly fibre wad, but with a sealing component at the bottom, which is also biodegradable. So basically, similar to the quad seal from Game Boy, you have a fibre wad with this seal at the bottom called a hemi seal. So we'll try them, see what they're like for penetration, see what it's like for recoil. Recoil was absolutely fine. Yeah, again, really good penetration. Lead pellets again, so they have become distorted. One of them stayed round, and that one has actually penetrated significantly further than the ones that change shape. So that is the Empire Hemi Seal, and that's the little disc that sat behind their fiber wad. And that again is completely biodegradable, completely safe to, to leave in the countryside. It'll dissolve in a short period of time. And that's the Empire version basically of what Game Boy called the quad seal. It doesn't look as high a quality made product as the Game Boy one, but if it's effective and if it works, it doesn't really matter what it looks like. So here is the last one we're going to try. It's from Joker and it's a very different type of cartridge. This is a clay cartridge. It's a 28 gram seven shot, sorry, 21 gram seven steel shot with Joker's own paper wad. And it'll be quite interesting to see how this wad holds together. We're going to shoot the gel with it just to see what sort of penetration we get with the seven shot in steel, but I wouldn't expect at 35 yards to get a massive amount of penetration. So here we can see the penetration from the steel seven shot. And I'm actually pleasantly surprised how well that's penetrated at 35 yards. Wouldn't use it for shooting game, but that would be an incredibly effective clay cartridge. We've got a lot of pellets on target. The wad did confetti quite a bit, but that's bound to happen with this price point product and with a paper wad. It seems to have done the job perfectly fine, protecting the barrel from the steel shot. And if you were after a budget steel clay load, I'd have absolutely no problem using these. They seem to do the job very, very well. So just to really test the limits of what these cartridges can do, and purely for fun, we're gonna shoot a block of gel at five yards with one of the Darkstorm high performance steel. Um, there's nothing scientific about this at all. I just want to do it for fun. I honestly thought they would have all gone through that. Some of the shot has come out the other end. Cartridges like that through a 12 bore, you don't want to be shooting something at five yards and expecting to put it on the table. All right, Jack, well, thanks again for coming down with your range of yielders to help us out with this test. Are all your guns capable of firing both to standard performance and high performance steel? Yes, as a sort of standard we do, when we bring them in, we get them high performance steel proofed. The only ones you can't do that on are the fixed chokes. 
but everything that comes in multi-choke, we get we get steel, steel, high performance steel proofed as, as standard. Do you have any information on us on the negative effects that putting steel through guns can have on a long-term basis? Personally, we just don't have the have the information to going forward. What we do know is that we just can't have steel to steel contact. In terms of long-term use, we have to wait until someone actually does a destructive test on it. So it's definitely something where there is more work needs to be done by manufacturers to give us clear information on how long our guns will last using steel, on the effects that steel on steel will have. We know it's a negative effect, but we don't know how quickly that's going to affect the performance or the structure of the, of the gun. No, we don't. I mean, it's a new thing for us here in the UK and in Europe, and I don't think the manufacturers have quite caught up because it's, it's suddenly just gone from being a discussion to something that we're actually very actively looking into as a as a as a shooting community. I mean we spoke earlier you, you buy a new car you don't expect the tires to last yeah. the lifetime of the car you know you're going to have to replace them every couple of years. If it becomes the same with shotguns that you're going to have to replace your barrels every two to five years and that is just part of the running cost of yeah. of that shotgun I can't see how it would be a major issue. It's, as you said, it's just changing the attitude. I think it's it's also changing the attitude of it being something that is a tool rather than something you're looking to pass down. Um, and that will, I think that it, we'll see sort of how different manufacturers sort of take to it and see what they do offer as their sort of service kit really for for the shotguns that they, they produce, like, like the sort of car manufacturers do with the servicing of, of their vehicles. Bring in the heirloom, Tim. What have we got here? You have to explain it to us here, Jack. So here, um, <laughs> I very luckily inherited a pair of Purdy's from my, my grandfather. And these are 120 odd years old, um, but they're not obviously with, with what we've been discussing with steel shot. There's not something that at the moment, unless you get a new set of barrels that you really want to put, put steel through or designed to have steel put through them. The gun industry is probably one of the few industries where something that old can still be compared to something this new. Yeah. But if times had to change and if because of the ammunition we had to use, you couldn't use them anymore, it's really not the end of the world when there's such value as this available. No, it's not the end of the world, it just comes down to sentimentality. Yeah, but a car from the same period you wouldn't still want to drive on the M25. No, but you still want to take it out. <laughs> yeah. So that gun there that I've been using, mm. with that grade of wood, what, what would that cost me retail? That would cost you, that particular model there, $1,750. I, I just can't quite believe it. I've, I've seen stocks made, yeah. just the stock with that sort of quality timber for more than twice that. It's, it is, and I think, especially with the European manufacturers, it's being coming from Turkey, they've got a lot of the manufacturers there have their own walnut groves, and they therefore have access to, to the really, really beautiful quality of wood. So a gun like that, beautiful quality timber, nice Parazzi Boss style action, yeah. proofed for high performance steel. Yeah, it was, we've been using it today for that purpose. For sub two grand. Yeah. So, I mean, really, if, if you had to replace that gun every five to ten years. It's feasible. It is, it is feasible. Yeah, it is very feasible. No, I just think it's absolutely stunning. So that was, that was really interesting. Uh, I did a bit of research on Google as to what sort of films have been done with shotgun shells using ballistic gel. And the only things I could find were Americans dressed up in monkey suits uh, shooting at gel blocks because of home security. So they were testing their shells on intruders. So to actually see it like this. I don't know why people haven't used it before. Um, maybe because rifle bullets just are more expansive and therefore it's, it's better sort of TV to see that type of thing. But anyway, I think it was, I think it was relatively useful. As you know, a few surprises. Yeah, a few surprises for me. Um, I was surprised at how to see how the lead pellets deformed on hitting the target. But of course, that's what lead is designed to do because yeah. it transfers the energy better by doing that. I was pleasantly surprised with the penetration we got with some of the steel loads, especially the standard velocity steel loads, which is great to dispel some of the myths that people say that isn't fit for purpose. But it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun. But the main thing for me was seeing how those wads held together. These new degradable wads that will last in water less than 24 hours, but they were holding together really well 
even when they'd gone through to, with the shot, hit the target, hit the sandbank, they were still held together really well, which was very encouraging for going forward if we do have to move away from lead. We have these alternatives here which are bio-friendly and that will hold steel shot together very well. 35 yards, looks a long way, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks... <laughs> You know. Yeah, and this is this is the, the problem that we have in shotgun in the shotgun shooting world. We all would like to think that we're capable of shooting things at sixty and seventy yards, and that steel cartridges aren't up to that. In reality, what I'm capable of shooting at is probably forty to forty five yards. I imagine a lot of people are in the same boat, and the steel cartridges we tested today are more than up to that task. By the time a lead ban comes, if it comes. I believe we'll be in a very, very good place to continue being able to shoot more or less as we are. There will have to be some changes made in shotgun manufacture, but I think the cartridge companies are really, really on the ball. Hopefully we won't have a lead ban, but if it comes, we need to educate ourselves, we need to arm ourselves correctly, but I think our manufacturers are doing a great job at leading that charge. Okay. As a farmer, Tim, do you re does it really matter? Do you care? I think it's, um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I have a responsibility to look after my land, my piece of England. And what I can't abide is seeing cartridges. I can't abide to see plastic wads on my fields. So anything we can do to reduce that, I think is a good thing. And my pigeon shooters, you know, they, there's an issue with actually selling the, the meat on, perhaps because it's, it's, it's got lead in it. So therefore, if they can shoot pigeons with still shot, they have a market for the meat. That's, that's got to be And so this, is, this is something that we haven't talked about, uh, is the fact that uh, the idea of having lead to shoot game, whether it be deer or whether it be game birds or whether it be pigeons, there seems to be, whether it's game dealers or whatever's driving it, you know, BGA, the idea is, is there. And, um, and so market forces are going to perhaps bring these to the fore anyway. Yeah, and it's... <sighs> It's where the, the conflict within the industry sort of comes from because you have some people saying that we need to clean up our act quickly and remove the lead from the situation. But to me personally, lead isn't such a big issue because it's a, it's a naturally occurring element. All we're doing is taking it out of the earth, rolling it into little balls and putting it back into the earth. It doesn't cause a massive impact. I mean, the manufacture of steel this shot is, it. is, this is it. Yeah. quite a dirty process. Mm. Um, steel shot rust. You go to clay grounds where they only use steel shot and the ground is completely scarred by its use. So there's, there's pros and cons of both. But yes, as you say, if our market won't accept our produce because it's been shot with lead, then we have an issue and we need to find an alternative. Steel is the most cost effective alternative, but there are other alternatives. In America, they use a lot of different alternatives for lead, which are as effective, if not more effective, they're more expensive. And that's something that we also need to look at. But ultimately, we're going to have to change our culture. Yeah. But there's an awful lot of myths and lies and mistruth, mistruths told about these cartridges. So that's, we just need to physically get out and test them ourselves and see what happens. Yeah. And we've done more of that, but that's going to be in a minute because we're now going to go to Johnny at R&K Stockcraft, who's going to talk about Springer Air Rifles. Springers, talk to me about Springers. In my humble opinion, this is um, an absolutely awesome bit of kit for the price point. So this is a, a Virac HW99S brake barrel spring rifle. It's got the same two-stage trigger unit in it that they use on their like flagship rifles, their top range rifles, HW97Ks, the big underlever rifles. They put that trigger unit on this gun. There's a, a lot of rifles on the market which try as you might as a youngster or an adult to try to produce good accuracy at 25 yards. It's just not happening. The rifle has just not got the ability to be, the trigger's too hard, the quality of the barrel's not good enough. And there's nothing more disheartening, I feel, for a youngster, and I was that youngster at one stage going through this process, where you can sit there and shoot, 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 shoot until your heart's content at 25 yards, trying to get a decent group on your thumbnail, and it just it won't happen because the bit of kit you're using just hasn't got the ability to deliver that sort of accuracy. 
And if you can find something and get pointed towards something like this, which is basically bypassing all the research, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end up disliked by a few people saying this, but never mind. So that, yeah, it's just the, the quality in this rifle, the quality of the build of the gun, um, it's open sight, you can shoot as is, it's railed for a scope, it's got arrestor drops in there, and the accuracy that this gun will deliver um, for the price point, it's £240 retail, it's absolutely superb, you know, really, really good. And in its class, as I say, I think this knocks spots off a lot of the other competition that's out there. Something like this, it's going to go on for years and years and years and years. You shoot it and then pass it down to your, your son or daughter and they can have some fun out of it as well. Thank you, Johnny, and we'll be hearing more from him and his knowledge of air rifles in upcoming field testers. Now, the next thing we did was play with the chronograph, which was nothing to do with me. This gentleman here asked to use the chronograph, and luckily Tim had one, which was very brave. I mean, the, the main idea for me of using the chronograph was just for my own curiosity to see would there be any major performance losses with these sort of wads. And we have the full selection of catches we've tried, and we're just going to put three rounds of each across the chronograph just to check the speeds. Now these speeds won't compare to any of the manufacturer's speeds from the factory because it's a very different situation. We're not measuring muzzle velocity, we're going to be six or seven feet away from the chronograph. But it's just to look at consistency and to see if the heavier recoiling cartridges translate into faster cartridges and really just to kind of dispel any myths about what cartridges are quicker than others. And we'll stick an average up of each of the set of three at the end. I mean, everything was pretty much as I expected. Very little difference between any of them. They're all pretty consistent. We fired three shots out of each one over the chronograph. Small variations, but you're always gonna get that. But it was just, there was no alarm bells went off. There was nothing surprising about it. What about recoil? A couple of them, you couldn't help yourself but go, Oof. So there was a couple that caught you out. Recoil, there was nothing crazy. I would have to use them a lot more before I could say whether one was significantly mm. kicky. Did you feel anything? Did you shot a few? I had to, they felt like a normal shotgun to me. Yeah, there was no difference there at all, so shot very well. Would you know? Probably not. <laughs> but, but, but at least I hit the close. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Moving on. I can't remember what else we do. He's thrown me now completely. What else did we do? So, any. any New innovations are pretty rare in the shooting industry anyway, but obviously these guys are uh, investing an awful lot of money in these particular products. These things have been boiling away in the background for a long, long time. I mean, I remember these being launched at the British Shooting Show in, uh, in 2019, and people expected them just to dissolve in your pocket. Well, I think we need to try that out, don't we? Have you got a soggy pocket? I always have a soggy pocket. Several people have actually mentioned to me that um, because these shells are biodegradable and they're compostable, do they actually attract um, moisture and everything else? We're not too sure. And the only way I can really test that is, is a kind of in a, in a true farmer's style. And this, this is kind of, you know, this is my typical pocket on the farm, really. Baylor twine, sisal, I even got a staple. Oh, I can recycle that one. I can straighten that out. But I've got bits of, um, Oh. <laughs> anyway, so well, here we go. So we got some cartridges here, and they're a bit dirty. But anyway, in true farmer style, we kind of roll them down our leg. Yeah, that'll do. And stick them in, in the in the shotgun. That's worth mentioning that your pocket is mildly damp. <laughs> <laughs> Full of mud. <laughs> and that's that's what a lot of the chat about, in particular the the Ely wad is the Eco wad that because it dissolves so quickly in water that if it's in a damp situation, if you're a wild fowler or a pigeon shooter and you've got them damp in your pocket or in your cartridge bag, that the wad will biodegrade inside the cartridge very quickly. So these have sat in your damp pocket yep. for 24 hours. Yep. Let's open them up and see how the, how the wad is. Well, let's see. I don't know what you think, Jason, but that's quite well protected in there, isn't it? So the top of the cartridge I think has been sealed as well, isn't it? I can't, I can't actually see it for the mud, but... Uh, yeah, it's like a heat seal heat, that they heat put in the middle there, to protect so. the crimp. Okay. Yeah, that seems absolutely fine. But yeah, it's absolutely 
In integrity wise is absolutely perfect. Still in good working order. We open the other ones and Yeah, there's yeah. definitely water has got into the bio ammo cartridge. I'll just move that powder around and they're stuck to the outside of the case inside of the case. So potentially that would have been an issue. However, that one doesn't dissolve. As quickly? No. How long was this one before it dissolves? A season. A season. Okay, so if the cartridges got damp and you managed to dry them out again, shouldn't be an issue, but... Also, I think that uh, she is not heat sealed at the top there, so that's yeah. probably why the, the moisture went in there, yeah. Try it again, Bor. Wow. That's pretty tight in there, actually, compared to the others. There we go. Yeah, it's bone dry, isn't it? Yep, yeah. that's bone dry in there. And this is the... It's the Joker paper. Okay, so... So first impressions before I take it apart. And that paper doesn't look particularly damp. Yeah, that looks good. Dries a bone. Dries yeah, a bone. That's dry. Yeah. And the uh, Empire cartridges, that's the last one to try. This is the important bit here, the biodegradable seal. Yep. Totally dry. Looks absolutely fine actually, yep. Right, that was a little bit literally dry, gentlemen. So <laughs> <laughs> Well in typical Phil Sports fashion, we had to go completely <laughs> overboard. <laughs> Peter Rich, all of a sudden. Right, yes. like, here's what we made earlier. <laughs> we had to go completely overboard <laughs> and put all of these totally in a jar of water for 24 hours. Um, there's something very nasty going on in there, as we can see. <laughs> and obviously, if you leave any cartridges submerged in water for, for 20, 24 hours, you wouldn't advise using them. But we just wanted to open them up and see how the wads have changed. We have a control here, which is a plastic wad. So I've seeped in there. Probably hasn't it's, gone down to the powder. Oh, right, there's there definitely is some down. There. Oh, definitely there is, is some, yeah, it's a little bit. I mean, to be honest, I, I That's think pretty impressive, actually. it would have been all right to use. Now we go on to our eco wads. So we've got the bio ammo. Little, little bit of moisture again, but I think the wad was doing its job keeping yep. the powder dry. Yep. And again, the, the Empire cartridge. It's worthwhile saying that none of these are supposed to dissolve in water, the ones we've done so far. I'm assuming you're leaving the best to the last, CJ. Yeah, exactly. But it's just to see how the cartridge is held together, just keeping the water out, how the wad has worked. That's got wet, hasn't it? Yep. Definitely dampness in the powder there. Okay. So now we get to the good ones, the ones that we expect to have changed. And straight away with the Joker, you can see that the paper wad has become very wet inside. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Very wet. Very wet. Has it gone down to the powder? Probably not. Yeah, it's, but it's the, definitely damp, isn't it? So. Your wad isn't going to be doing its job. No. Considering that wad's job is to protect the barrel from the steel when it's become wet like that. So now to we'll see what the game bore bio wad is like. Okay, so what have we got there? If you look at that carefully, Jason, it looks like that the wad has started to degrade. Yeah. It's gone soggy, in other words. Which, in fairness, is yeah. exactly what it's designed to do. Meant to do. Yeah, you, you wouldn't definitely wouldn't want to shoot that, but it's doing exactly what it's designed to do, which is dissolve within 24 hours. And last, try the Ely with the Pro Eco Wad. There you go. Yeah, very Powder, powder's dry at the bottom there. Yeah, that's gone very brittle and gooey. No real surprises there then. I mean, the two that say they dissolve the quickest have started to dissolve. But the main point to take from this from me is you've gone out pigeon shooting, rough shooting, wild fowling, whatever, and you've chucked a box of cartridges in your pocket. You've fired four or five of them. There's been a light shower rain. Your pockets got damp. You don't want to be chucking 10, 15 quid worth of cartridges away because you think that because they've got a biodegradable wad that they're going to be ruined. They're not going to be ruined. The outer case on the cartridge is going to protect them fine. Just get them home, get them dry, and they'll be absolutely fine the next day you go out. 
obviously keeping them submerged in water for any length of time isn't <laughs> ideal and I wouldn't ever use them but we were just doing that to highlight the effect that that will have on them and to some of them it was quite negligible you still wouldn't want to use them but it's just a highlight that they're not going to completely fall to pieces in a matter of hours. We were pushing the boundaries there and of course they were going to get wet you know it's uh, it would be extraordinary if they didn't um, but we were just dealing with a concern that a lot of people had and when we were talking about putting this together that was one of the first things you said was you know are they going to get damp is you know because obviously these these will if they get damp they they basically dissolve into nothing so yeah and it's the big concern with that obviously is safety that if the wad degrades inside the cartridge and it becomes a sloppy mess and you pull the trigger and somebody's barrels blow up it's far from ideal so it was it was trying to sort of dispel that but also test it so as regards normal use of these for, with wild fowling with pigeon shooting with rough shooting with game shooting if some rain got into your cartridge bag or anything like that i think get them home get them dry and there will be absolutely no issue with using them no okay so as part of Field Tester, we go to gun shops across the country and ask for their independent advice about different products. I recently went to Clooney's and they talked to me about moderators. To avoid this, clean your moderator. We get a lot of people that don't look after their moderators at all. They will clean their guns, um, but the moderators are kind of put on the back burners a little bit. Um, and as a result, if I can grab this gun just behind me here, um, you can get quite big issues with the thread on the end of the rifles, obviously to where the moderator is screwed onto. Um, you can see on this one here, it's been neglected and it's got rust around the thread and then the crown at the top um, does start to kind of wear away and then the moderator won't be on right, it might not be perfectly concentric because of course we don't want to lose accuracy, the gun would be a lot less accurate. So a good way of avoiding that is with proper maintenance of the moderators. There's obviously various different moderators on the market. Some are enclosed units, like these two here, and then others are kind of made up of the baffles or, or housing. Now, a really simple way of doing it is, is just spraying oil down the moderator, putting it aside and letting it condense. We are slightly biased here because we <laughs> sell and are the distributors of um, these moderators, Freer and Devic. They have uh, a really, I mean, they just make it simple, to be honest with you. Once you've screwed it off the gun, if I just take this part here, um, you are just taking the housing apart, not any of the baffles. You can get in right to the baffle stack. You would do the same again. You'd spray oil down, get some good coverage on throughout the moderator. Um, and then you could get something like one of these, which is just a simple, basic nylon brush. Um, and you can really just get into, into the gubbins of it and clean it thoroughly in the thread as well, if you can see in there get into the thread and just make, make, make life easy, treat it well. It is metal after all, as is the end of the gun, and it will give you better longevity on all of your kit, which we all want. These companies have come up with these various different bio wads and eco wads and spent hundreds of thousands of pounds. I have literally spent 50 pounds and developed my own vegan round. All right, gents, I know we've been doing all this stuff, but I've come up with my own little plan here. I've been working with Nick Horton. This is eco, but this is vegan friendly. We, we tried to, I mean, I commissioned him <laughs> for him to put these together. So this, the different loads, okay? So this one is, this one, right, have a look at that one, see what you think. They're vegan extremes, okay? Right. A and... couple of those, couple of those, here. A bit light. They are a bit light. They're a bit light. They're, that's, that was one of the problems. This is teething problems. Yeah, we worked through it. We worked through it. But I think if we can get the loads right, we're onto something. Forget because eco. Forget bio wads. You know, we're talking vegan friendly. The branding, I think, needs a little it's, bit of work. I know. I might have been slightly inebriated when I wrote that, but yeah, that stands for chaos power. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Right, open them up, open them up, open up. <laughs> it's chickpeas! <laughs> For goodness sake, David. See, so the, the trouble is it's too light, but this is the larger load. Okay. The larger animal. Is that, is that number three shot, is this? I don't know, you tell me. I'm not used to this stuff. I think it's, it's probably, probably one, number one, isn't it? They look like... 
Rapid lightning, that one is. Right. <laughs> See the one I'm, I'm using components not under license from other people. What? <laughs> what is that? So that's red lentil. Again, you've got a lighter load, but it still didn't have the downrange power. That's right. Nice. I suppose if you don't, See, if you don't kill exactly, something, exactly. Listen, you've you're got, not going to go you, hungry. You, you're travelling with your meal. <laughs> and then we have... The gunpowder makes nice seasoning. <laughs> <laughs> um, spurt powder. <laughs> <laughs> you got, there's another one there. Anyway, we spent a lot of time working on this, so we had um, mixed herbs and all sorts of things. But we've actually come out with a load that does work. Now apparently I've heard of people who actually loaded their shotgun cartridges with rice before, but feel the weight on that. Not that one, actually feel the weight on this one. Because <laughs> that's very light. <laughs> but I have been told... Oh that one's that one, that one, that one. That yeah, one will go. 21 gram. That one will go. Are you going to shoot it? Yes. Can we? You can shoot that one. Yeah. Huh? Honestly. No. Okay. You can shoot that one. So a righty rice extreme at the optimum range for this load, <laughs> which is four paces. <laughs> Top barrel, which is full rice choke. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, a little damage with the wad. <laughs> Yes, we got rice in it. There you go. It's got, you definitely got rice in there. But sadly, the water's done more damage than the rice. <laughs> there you go. Proof that there's rice in there. Well done, Nick. It worked. That's the drawing board, Nick. <laughs> On the plus side, it's definitely one of the lighter recoiling catches I've fired. <laughs> <laughs> Would you advise rice? I probably would advise rice, but uh, it's quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> so those vegan shells were an absolute dog's dinner. But what about a dog's dinner? Should that be vegan too? So here we've got a, a vegan uh, pelleted dry food, raw meat, and then the meat and vegetable. We've had a lot of very high profile people talking about they're now feeding their dogs vegan food. Is that a good thing? Dogs have evolved over thousands and thousands of years to primarily eat a meat diet. And dogs aren't like cat. Cats are what we call obligate carnivores. They, they have to have a meat diet. Dogs are what we call facultative carnivores, which means ideally they want to eat the majority of their diet as meat. They can eat some non-meat, uh, fruits, things like that, and we know they do. You know, they, <laughs> I, my dogs have been going out and eating the plums in my garden. Now, the fact they can eat some is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, my dogs end up with, uh, you know, very nasty, loose feces as a result of eating those plums, but they like them. The point is that about a facultative carnivore is that they can eat other things, but we don't necessarily consider that those are good things for them. Evolutionary wise, a dog would survive best on a very high percentage of meat in its diet. As we reduce that amount of meat, and, and if we eliminate meat uh, completely, we still don't really know if that's, that's a good thing for dogs long term. You know, we, this is something we've only really been moving over to, I'd say, you know, in recent years. And we don't yet really know the long term consequences for, for dogs of a purely uh, vegetable based diet. What's it missing? Meat is incredibly high in creatine it doesn't exist in plants. You can only get creatine from eating a meat-based diet or, a, a, or from adding creatine to the feed. For an athletic dog in particular, creatine, I would say, is essential. Creatine supplements have been used in human sport at high level for about 15, 20 years now, and they are, they are beneficial. Um, and if people are not on a meat diet, then they would take possibly, you know, e even more indication to take a creatine supplement. So there may still be things that are missing from these, these vegetable based feeds that are not being provided from a meat diet. A dog can survive on 
a diet like this. The question is, is it going to thrive on a diet like this? And I don't think I'd be looking to feed this to a working dog. That would be based on my knowledge of what's in the you know, scientific literature, based on you know, my knowledge of dog nutrition, I don't think I would. Decision. So it's the raw meat with some vegetable. No, is it? <laughs> right, we need to bring a Labrador in. No, here we go. <laughs> here we go. It's the raw meat with the vegetable. So, come on in, have a go, Mac. What do you think? Oh, easy, easy. <laughs> straight. Sniff that. <laughs> straight for the meat with a little vegetable in. And then straight on to the raw meat. Okay, so now we're going to try Brody with the three foods. Brody, come on in. Oh, so. <laughs> Ah. If you've ever owned a Labrador, you know, <laughs> half the time you, you think when you get back from a walk, do I really need to feed my dog? Because I've seen it eat half a dead rabbit and I've seen it eat you know, half a pigeon. Dogs have a, an incredibly robust gastrointestinal system. The sort of stuff that we eat that would, you know, give us, either make us vomit or give us serious diarrhea is no consequence to most dogs. They have a, a high tolerance. So even if the meat isn't, you know, been particularly well, the hygienic quality is not that great and, and would make a person ill, for a dog it's usually fine. So, you know, if your dog is healthy on a raw meat diet, fine. And your dog's performing well and is healthy, stick with that. If your dog is, is happy on the uh, tin diet, fine. If your dog's got a problem, the one of the first places you start to look at is the diet. You know, if your dog's got a skin problem or your dog is losing weight, you obviously start looking at the diet as one of the key reasons for trying to understand what's going on. All right, last thing. Can you give me like top five things not to feed your dog? Okay, so five of the things that would be really toxic to dogs would be uh, garlic, Good dogs should never have garlic. Uh, onions, which are part of the same family. Chives, they're all, this is part of the same family. Um, surprisingly enough, avocados, which are quite sweet tasting and, uh, and, and I'm sure dogs would like. Uh, a bit of a strange one is macadamia nuts. Uh, they're fairly toxic. And then I'm sure most dog owners would already know grapes, raisins, sultanas, anything like that is, is a real sort of uh, thing to avoid. And of course, uh, the big one is chocolate. And chocolate's a really weird one because, uh, again, my Labrador won Christmas somehow when I had young children, ate three advent calendars, absolutely fine. But, you know, some dogs can eat one square of chocolate and will have, uh, you know, really nasty convulsions as a result and be really seriously ill. So it's best to steer, you know, clear of chocolate completely as well, unless it's, it, unless it's the, the, the specific dog chocolate that's produced, which should be safe. Now, in last month's show, we looked at shotguns under 500 pounds. Well, Charlie's been to see Ian Hodge and asked him about shotguns under a grand. Lots of people are thinking of swapping their non-steel proof shotguns for a modern gun that can shoot steel. So what do you buy for under 2,000 pounds? I ask Ian Hodge, who runs the fabulous Ian Hodge Field Sports near Wadebridge in Cornwall. A lot of people are coming in quite concerned. Uh, that they're going to buy something or they've got something that they won't be able to use. So we are beginning to see the question asked, uh, you know, is this gun going to fire steel and can it fire steel? So we are uh, seeing a movement over to steel proof shotguns. They're, they're going for the, 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 the favourites really still, the, the, the Beretta Silver Pigeon, the Browning 525. Beretta do, do a, a white onyx which is a, a silver pigeon but a little bit plainer. All the modern guns are, are, are good. People come to Ian's shop from all over the UK. You can see Ian's guns on his website and on guntrader.co.uk or just drop in. Now it's not always about buying kits, sometimes it's about selling kit. But how do you get the best price for your gun? Well we've been to see Dan Poole down in Braces to find out. It's really important to 
to check it's got all the accessories it came with when it was new. That's a, a big theme for customers. Has it got its case? Has it got its chokes? Has it got the original box? So I always recommend if you're buying a new gun, keep hold of that stuff. It will make the difference you know, of hundreds of pounds at some point if you ever want to trade it back in again. It's nice to know with the rifles how many shots it's fired, but generally I take that with a pinch of salt because quite often people lie. <laughs> My key bit of advice if you want to get good trading values or good value out of your gun when you come to sell it is really maintain it, look after it. I know that they will work with very little maintenance, but I think it's definitely worth cleaning, servicing, and in general, if you pick up little knocks on a gun, have them repaired as it go, as you go. I think uh, when it comes to selling it in the future, which you invariably will do at some point, it's nice to have a presentable thing to put in front of the shopkeeper or your mate you're selling it to, rather than something that looks like it's walked in itself. When we get them traded in, we have to do a number of, of things to make them presentable for the shop. Um, if the barrels are all rusty and that the stock needs refinishing, it needs to go to the gunsmith for a month. Obviously, we, we have to factor that into the price we can offer you. Um, let's be honest, that the less work that I have to do, the, the better presented the gun is when it arrives, the more we can offer you for it. So, gentlemen, um, thank you very much for today. We've covered a lot of ground. These guys have covered a lot of ground, all these different companies here. Have they got where they need to be? Should we be satisfied by where they are? Um, and also, should they be applauded for where they've got to? For me, I want ultimate performance with zero plastic waste going into the countryside. And with this selection, I think we've done that. We've got fantastic performance from some top brands, and I can be confident that you're not littering if it comes to the point where we can't use lead anymore, that same innovation that these guys have developed with these wads can be transferred to steel cartridges. So we're in a good position, I feel. Do we need to do more with steel? I hope not, because for me, lead is still the best to use in cartridges. But why are we doing this? Why have these, why have these companies done this? Is it for... PR reasons outside the industry, or is it for PR reasons within the industry? Will we feel, will you feel better shooting these or these or these? Well, I mean, we've had to use steel wild fowling for years, so that development has always been Yeah, there. but it's, look, at, look, at, look at that, you know, you've got trees, you've got, you know, you've got compost, you've got little sprouts coming out of the shell there. You know, this is an image, this is, this is, a, this is a PR thing, but is it a PR thing directed at the shooter or is it a PR thing directed at the, um, at the general public? I think every industry now is trying to clean up their act as regards the waste they send to landfill, the materials they use in their manufacturing processes, and the cartridge industry is no different. We have to be guided by other industries and by just social feeling. I don't think it matters whether you're a hunter or not. We all know that chucking dangerous materials into the countryside is not a good idea. So I think the, the cartridge manufacturers are going with that and they're trying to help us clean up our industry before we have to. So would you feel more comfortable shooting maybe a box of the, the bio ammo and maybe not reaching a bird that's 10 yards higher because, and the other guy is next to you because he's got his lead, traditional lead shells. I mean, it's, is that, what's that, what's that gonna, buying, a pair, buying a box of that is gonna do what for your soul, do you think? That's an interesting question. I think that, to me, I suppose it's not just us, it's the generations which are following us. And that's where our responsibility is. And I think if we can, we can actually be the people to start the process going, I think I'll feel an awful lot happier because I think the journey is to start using this very, very quickly. And yes, if there is a lack of performance at long range, well, don't shoot long range, it's as simple as that. Yeah, and just to draw on a point you said about the gun next to me shooting a bird that's 10 yards further away, if that happens, it's most likely not down to the cartridges I'm using. <laughs> <laughs> it's down to his ability versus mine. And that's what a lot of people need to accept. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for watching. <laughs>